Hey, it's Mr. Lineski with the last section of Unit 2, all about logic. Today we are talking about deductive reasoning and the laws of logic. Uh, back in Section 1, we talked about inductive reasoning, uh, which was all based on patterns. Uh, now we're going to look at deductive reasoning, which is essentially based on fact. Um, there's something called the laws of logic that allow us to make valid conc conclusions. And so your laws of logic are the law of detachment and the law of syllogism. So we're going to kind of take a look at these and see what exactly they look like. Um, so if the hypothesis is true, uh, then the conclusion is also true. And we're going to kind of look at these problems in a three sort of prong step. So we're going to be given something in step one, something will be established in step two, and then step three is a conclusion based on what we know. Um, and so the scenario here is um, if I do my homework, then I will be successful. And so now if I told you, hey, Sam did her homework, well, if P is true, hey, Sam did her homework, then we can make the conclusion that Q is true. So if Sam did her homework, what can we say about Sam? We can say Sam will be successful. Um, the law of syllogism is kind of similar to the transitive property, where we have that middleman. So as a reminder, transitive property looked like this. It was if this, then this. And we were eliminating that middleman. Um, so it kind of looks like this. If hypothesis P, then conclusion Q. If hypothesis Q, then conclusion R. And we can cut out this middleman of the part that's repeated and say, if hypothesis P, then conclusion R. Um, in order for the law of syllogism to be um, valid, uh, the conclusion of one statement must be the same as the hypothesis of another statement. Um, and so again, we're looking at sort of a three-step process where we're given P implies Q. So if I go to the movies, then I will buy popcorn. So this is P, this is Q. Step two, we're given something else. We're told that if I buy popcorn, so hey, that sounds familiar. Oh, that's my Q from up here. Then I will buy a drink. That's some new scenario. I'm going to buy a drink. That's step R. So now what valid conclusion can I make? Well, if I go to the movies and buy popcorn, if I buy popcorn, I buy a drink, I can cut out the middleman and conclude that if I go to the movies, then I will buy a drink. So notice we kind of rewrote an entire new if-then statement. So that's law of syllogism. There's something called the law of contrapositive, which if you remember a contrapositive um, from the last section, contrapositive is when we switch, yo, that's supposed to be a Q. Uh, that's when we switch and negate, so we're kind of looking at this. Um, that basically says that if the not conclusion statement is true, then the not hypothesis is also true. So here's our three-step process. Step one, P implies Q. If you are a student at Rockridge, that's P. Q is you are a phoenix. Now, any time problems have the word you in it, it doesn't mean you directly. It's sort of the general you. And so that means you can substitute any name in there. And so if you take a look at um, part two, it says Ricky is not a phoenix. So being a phoenix is Q. But I'm telling you Ricky's not a phoenix. So I'm giving you that um, not Q is true. So what can I conclude? Well, if Ricky's not a phoenix, then he must not be a student at Rockridge. So that's a valid conclusion that we're allowed to make. So this is also valid or true. Um, so that's law of contrapositive. There are two, however, types of errors that can be made whenever we are determining if a statement is valid. Um, and that is known as the converse error and the inverse error. So just remember that converse is when we switch and inverse is when we negate. So if you notice these things happening in our three-step process, that these are not valid conclusions. We can't say that this is true. So we're going to take a look at some examples here in a sec. So this is sort of an example of what it would look like, and I want you to get used to the fact of, or, or the process, I guess, of seeing these three steps. So if you notice, one, two, three, one, two, three. 
Um, and then we're going to circle whether or not it's true or uh, not valid, and then explain why. And then you're going to write out what's going on in symbols here so you get used to seeing the symbols. So if you are an architect, then you love to draw. So P implies Q. The cool thing about these is that your first step is always going to be P implies Q. Chris is an architect, so what's happening? I'm telling you someone is an architect. I'm establishing P. Therefore, Chris loves to draw. That's Q. Loving to draw is Q. So is this a valid conclusion? Yes, that's our law of detachment. So law of detachment looks like these three steps in that order. And technically, symbolically, we should be saying, therefore, Q. Remember, the three dots mean therefore. Uh, one, eating ice cream makes my mouth cold. Notice I don't have an if-then here. Um, so you might want to say something like, if I eat ice cream, then my mouth is cold. So eating ice cream is P, your mouth being cold is Q. Remember, that first step is always P implies Q. When my mouth gets cold, that sounds familiar, that sounds like Q. Um, my teeth hurt, so that's some new thing. Notice, again, I can put if my mouth gets cold, then my teeth hurt. Um, and so that's Q implies R, sort of establishing some new scenario. So can I then say, therefore, eating ice cream makes my teeth hurt? That's our middleman. Mouth getting cold, mouth getting cold. Eliminate those things and mush P and R together. And that's what happened. Therefore, P implies R. Is that true? Yes, that's our law of syllogism. Moving on, if you live in Virginia, then you live in the United States. P, Q, remember, first step, always P, Q. Second step, Aaron lives in the United States. So I'm telling you that Aaron lives in the United States. That's Q. Living in the United States is Q. Therefore, can we conclude that she lives in Virginia? Living in Virginia is P. Can I do this? No, because remember, when I switch it, that's invalid. That's a converse error. If I go from PQ to QP, converse error. Just because someone lives in the United States it doesn't guarantee they live in Virginia. Um, all right, taking a look at the next one. All engineers use mathematics on the job. Notice no if then, but you could say if you are an engineer, um, then you use mathematics on the job. So being an engineer is P, using mathematics on the job can be Q. First step, always PQ. Sick of me saying it yet? Probably. Colleen does not use mathematics on the job. Using mathematics on the job is Q. I'm telling you that someone does not use mathematics. So I am telling you the opposite of Q. If Colleen does not use mathematics on the job, can I conclude that Colleen is not an engineer? Sorry, I keep forgetting my dots. Therefore, Colleen is not an engineer. So if I don't use mathematics, is it safe to conclude I'm not an engineer? Yes, it is. Why? It's the law of contrapositive. Notice, PQ became not Q, not P. That's switch and negate. Law of contrapositives. If you do not dance face to face with a little bit of space, then you will not have fun at the homecoming dance. One thing I want to point out here, just because the word not appears in here does not mean it is negated. This is just my P statement. So I'm still going to say P implies Q even though the word not is there. Mark is dancing face to face with a little bit of space. So that is not P. Therefore, he is having fun at the homecoming dance. That's not Q. So I negated. PQ became not P, not Q. That is invalid. That's an inverse error. And then the last one here, it says if you have math class, having math class is P. What's going on with my pen? Oh my golly. No! Help. All right, that's acting weird. Sorry, hold on one moment. Okay. If you have math class, that's P, then you will have homework, that is Q. P implies Q, always your first step. 
if you have science class, wait a second, something new. It's not P and it's not Q, we'll call that R. Then you will have a test. Having a test, I didn't read that anywhere. Let's call that S. R implies S. Therefore, if you have math class, that's P, uh, then you will take a test, S. Can I logically mush these two things together? No, because there's no repetition here. So now this is trying to conclude this, which is invalid. And what we call that, it's trying to be law of syllogism, but we can just say that that is no syllogism. All right, I know that seemed like a lot, but as a little extra bonus here, all I'm going to do is just kind of sum all that up in one little page here. Um, so hopefully this kind of all shows up on the screen. Uh, we'll see. Um, so what does this look like symbolically? Remember, the first line will always be PQ. Then what you do is you combine lines two and three to think about the validity. So for valid statements, true statements, we have uh, three scenarios. If line two and three go PQ, that's true and it's detachment. If line two and three go not Q, not P, that's true, it's contrapositive. If line two and three go Q, R, P, R, that's syllogism. Our invalid statements are not P, not Q, that's inverse. And then two and three, if it's Q and P, that is a converse error. Bonus thing you didn't know. Alrighty, thank you for watching the video. Last one of the unit, getting ready for the test. I know it, and now you know it.